The Hogsty presents It's Just Business with Steve Thomas and Rich Rogers. And now, here's your host, Chris Larry. Hello and welcome to another episode of It's Just Business, part of the Hogsty Network. This show where we look at the business, the dollars and cents, the media, the cha-ching of what's going on in the sports industry. I am joined by my colleagues in Gab, Rich, and Steve. Hello, gentlemen. How are hey you guys? How are you doing? How are you, Chris? <laughs> Doing I'm right. doing wonderful here this late summer, just before the football season starts and things start to heat up, so uh, excited to get at it. Hey, let me yeah. make a plea before everybody gets started here. Um, for those of you who don't know out there, I live in Texas, uh, live in the Houston area, and, and so I, we just went through Hurricane Harvey here. Uh, I'm, for those of you who care, I'm fine, but the city most certainly is not. So I, I wrote a post that has gone up, or a column that's gone up on our website that tells you, if you want to donate and help out the city, it gives some what I believe to be are the reputable uh, some of the reputable charitable fa- organizations that are helping here. Um, so please help because you know it may be over now, but it, this is going to be a multi-billion-dollar, multi-year recovery here. And, and at last count, there's about thirty thousand people in shelters still, and it's a week later. So please help, and please, it's on our site right now. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. That's a great message to kick us off, and I will definitely – I've been looking for some good inside – you know, it's so confusing sometimes where to give your money, so I appreciate right. the tips on insider look. Um, so we're going to jump into our topics today. The first one is uh, our As the Ball Family Turns, dun, 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 uh, <laughs> where we look at the goings-on of the, of the Ball family and their quest for shoe and basketball dominance. Uh, they got – into maybe a little bit of a quandary, if you will, uh, recently, is have they put one of their chips in jeopardy at UCLA? Steve, you want to give us the quick update? Sure. Well, the quick update is that uh, LaMelo Ball now has a, a shoe, a branded shoe on the Big Baller brand. So he's got the LaMelo Ball, the Z02. Or no, it's I'm sorry. That's the Lonzo Ball. Um, he's got a LaMelo Ball shoe. Um, now, just to catch everybody up here, LaMelo is the youngest one. Lonzo is the one that's the Laker. LiAngelo is the one that's about to go to, to um, uh, UCLA. And LaMelo is the youngest kid who is, I believe, a sophomore in high school. He's the one that got in trouble for yelling the N-word out at on stage at a WWE um, event a couple months ago. So the issue here is now that he has a shoe, he's making money off the shoe. So is this in jeopardizing his NCAA amateur status for purposes of playing basketball at UCLA? That's the first question is and the second question does the family even care? Cuz I'm not sure they do. Surely they know the rules. They've already had one kid go through this. So the question is what is the dad is driving all this, right? So what is Daddy Ball thinking here? What do you guys think? Well, I think um, Daddy Ball is thinking he's trying to push his uh, trying to push his brand, and he's trying to promote his sons. And I think you bring up an interesting question. Um, this, to me, is clearly seems to be um, an NC would be an NCAA violation because um, this could. Venture in the line of being a professional athlete if he's uh, receiving money or receiving compensation based on um, based on the product. But um, I think he's always trying to keep his son and his brand out in the front in in the forefront. And um, we've we've debated that ad nauseum. Uh, but this is uh, I think again this is just another it could be another stunt could be another way of trying to set his sons up for quote unquote success. I mean, it's not a stunt though. Because the Mellow Ball shoe is a shoe that is out there and exists and that you can order at this point. One thing is I can guarantee for sure is this. The Mellow Ball will not play basketball at UCLA and have this shoe for sale. One or the other has to give. There's no way, I think, absent a major shift in NCAA rules that this is going to continue. So I, it makes me wonder whether LaMelo Ball is even going to play college basketball. 
you know, is he just gonna, is he going to sit out a year and just go straight into the er, try to go straight in the NBA? You know, none of us are basketball you know experts here, but my understanding is he's not quite the player that Lonzo is at a minimum. So, Chris, what do you think? I cut you off. I think. What do you think? Uh, I think it's fascinating. <laughs> One, I think this is a little bit of the intersection of a couple things we've sort of hit on as themes throughout the Ball Family Turns uh, conversation. One is the indie cottage industry of the shoes. So I think it's really like no one's done this at the level of scale that even they've already attained, let alone their aspirations and ambitions. So if they think – if they see some trends that are positive, they have a, a product in the market, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, they got a you know, player now in the NBA – then all these rules need to be looked at to see you know, how you deal with something outside of the corporate structure. I think you're probably right. It's still a violation, but they're, they're forcing the issue on looking at how to legislate and manage that. Two, I think this is a leverage move on the part of Daddy Ball, which I think is officially his new name, <laughs> um, in that – if the if the eldest ball can really make a dent and they got some positive news from uh, the the summer leagues, then they can leverage the anticipation for ball two uh, and maybe that is a value in sitting out a year and it just brings credibility to their shoe that he sacrificed a year of you know college eligibility for it. So I think it's a I think it's a completely planned move that probably has him not play college ball and is all part of their kind of you know at least their attempt at three dimensional chess. I wonder honestly if Daddy Ball doesn't see that Lamelo isn't good enough to ever play NBA basketball. And so he's turning him into a marketing star and a reality TV star instead. You know, I've never seen the kid play. I know he's put up some humongous numbers in AAU ball. He's put up like 80-point games and stuff. Um, but it makes me wonder if LeVar, who clearly does know basketball at a minimum because he got Lonzo all the way to the NBA, <laughs> um, it makes me wonder if he knows LaMelo is just never going to make it. And you know, because because he could sit out of here, but what is he gonna? Where is he gonna play? Is he gonna send him to China for a year? You know, to play uh, basketball. I just find that highly suspect that he's gonna send his son overseas for a year. And I also find it highly suspect that he's just gonna sit out a year if Lamelo does have NBA aspirations. So I'm I think the key. I think the key is going to be whether Lonzo really can play at the NBA level and play at a high level. When you look at um, what. You know what, Dad has set him up to be, and uh, Lonzo's a, a pretty good player. And as you mentioned, Steve, uh, there have been some early returns that he's decent in summer league, but summer league is summer league. Right. And when you're playing on the West, you know you're playing in the in the Western Conference, which is the strongest conference uh, in the league. So I think the difference here, one of the things that that would be interesting to see is if Lonzo can actually become a superstar on the basketball court, and I think that would have a huge impact on his marketability. I mean, if he's a bench player, um, a role player, then I think a lot of this, I think actually a lot of this goes away. Um, well, I, you guys know, but I don't know how many out there in the audience know. I am a Laker fan. Um, and no, I'm not a bandwagon fan. I did live in L.A. for a time as a kid, and that's why I'm a Laker fan <laughs> during the match. Since what? Uh, since uh, George Mikan or uh, I, those I, days? I, or? First of all, you're older than me, buddy, so don't, you know. I, you are older than I am, Rich, so. <laughs> no, I go back to the early days of Magic Johnson. I go back okay. to the day when I was a kid. I, somebody, an adult, telling me that Magic got Paul Westhead fired, and I, which I didn't understand <laughs> at the time. But point is. I watched all these summer league games with Lonzo, and uh, Lonzo, the Lakers think he's going to be a star. He was putting up triple doubles. He was putting up numbers that nobody puts up in summer league. So, I guess I'm biased, but you know, I'll say that up front. But I think Lonzo's on his way to being, to fulfilling his destiny. Put it that way, <laughs> or his potential rather, as a basketball player. So, I. I think he's probably going to be good. I don't know what that says about the other two kids, except to your point, you know, it makes them more visible and more marketable if the older brother is a star. But specifically about this Lamelo thing, I think if if Lavar Ball is challenging the NCAA's rules with regard to income uh, for amateur athletes, he's going to lose. Okay, no what year is he in high school? What year? What year? I is he? think he's a sophomore. <laughs> Interesting because maybe by the time he becomes a senior, maybe the NBA changes the rule, eliminates the uh, the one year rule, 
uh, by the time he comes out of college. I mean, by the time he comes out of high school. I, I don't know if the. I mean, if I don't know if you guys have seen any indication from the NBA that they intend on eliminating that, but I have not seen it. And I don't, you know, and absent that, I can't imagine they would eliminate that. Eliminate that because it's frankly good for everybody if these kids go to college. It's good for the NBA. It's good for bas- in, NCAA basketball. It's good for the kid in terms of basketball development, not income, obviously. So I, unless you guys have seen something on that, I, I tend to believe that the NBA will keep that one-year rule in place for the foreseeable future. I, I think he. I think Daddy Ball is really making a play – you know, as the ball family cottage industry of basketball uh, with various verticals um, that they're making a leverage play that they don't need college. Um, and, and that the, all these moves are sort of interlocked into sort of demonstrating that. Cause yeah, you could send these kids, you know, especially if they're marketing the shoe, you can buy it, you can buy them coaching, et cetera. You can send them to Europe for a year of seasoning. I think they're almost making a play at like, how do you end around all of these systems? The, uh, you know, the NCAA corporate shoe deals. Um, I think that's, that's his overall vision. And this is just a step. But we're going to know, like, by the end of next season, whether Lamelo is legit or not, you know, because he's he's going to re- he's been he's rated now by you know the various scouting agencies. But if if this kid is going to be a five star prospect, big time, you know, we're going to know, you know, and if he's not, he's not. Because unlike football, most of the guys who make the NBA, you know, all the way back in high school, just because of the nature of basketball. <laughs> And so I think we're going to know how good this kid LaMelo actually is. Here's the quote. That I, I'm reading from uh, Street and Smith Sports Business Daily, which I don't believe is available to the public. I think you have to have a – it's behind a paywall. But um, they say they've, they've – the line here is that LaVar Ball said that he, quote, isn't concerned whether LaMelo's shoe will affect his son's college eligibility. And, of course, UCLA said, you know, that we have, they have no comment because the kid isn't even there yet. So LeVar Ball apparently isn't concerned at all. So I, you may be right, Chris. You know, it, maybe this is a big leverage play, like you said. Um, I, I just can't imagine that LeVar is so dumb as to in, intentionally harm his son's eligibility without a plan. We'll see. it would be interesting to follow. And you know we will be following it as the ball family turns. Maybe the ball family spins. We'll debate that. I'll um, get back to you. Because um, it kind of makes right, more right. sense to say spins, doesn't it? It does. It's basketball. Yeah, I think so. We'll officially we'll mint that. Um, we'll ship all these changes for the next episode. Uh, next topic is this sort of continuing confusion storm debate around Ezekiel Elliott and his six-game suspension from the NFL. Lots of different issues here, just forcing some fights between uh, the union and the league. Is it causing some fractures within the ownership because uh, Jerry Jones stomping mad, et cetera? A lot of angles here. I'll just say I'm going to turn this one over to the both of you because while I consider myself a very cynical, rational, realistic fan of sports, hatred of the Dallas Cowboys and being pro anything that hurts them really does is the last irrationality in my sports brain. And so while I am probably on the side of the union on most things, I want Ezekiel Elliott to ride the pine for six games. So I don't know if I can speak rationally. So I'm going to leave it to the two of you. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I mean, my my cowboy hating, you know, person inside me definitely wants Ezekiel Elliott out for as long as possible. Um, But let's just get a couple things straight here about what's actually going on. The NFL spent about a year investigating Ezekiel Elliott and the allegations brought by his girlfriend, a woman named Lee Thompson, Leah Thompson, Tiffany Thompson, I'm sorry, Tiffany Thompson, uh, who said that Elliott abused her uh, five times while he was still in college. And so the NFL spent an entire year investigating this. Now, for those of you who don't know, they have a whole big investigative arm uh, you know that that investigates all sorts of things. Kia Roberts, woman named Kia Roberts, is the director of investigations um, for this, and and so she spent a year on this. Now, uh, the NFL um, discipline is governed by Article Forty Six of the Collective Bargaining Agreement, and it gives Roger Goodell wide-ranging powers. Okay, um, 
all it says is the commissioner can take action for conduct detrimental to the integrity of public confidence in the game of football. Okay, that's all it says. And so basically, whatever is um, whatever affects the integrity of or public confidence in the game of football can be disciplined. Out of that is born the personal conduct policy. Uh, which has been revised recently uh, in the past couple of years as a result of the Ray Rice incident and the the punter for the Giants. Help me, Brown. What's his first name? Somebody. Josh mm. Brown. Josh he was the place kicker. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Josh Brown admitted to abusing his wife and only got a game. And, you know, Ray Rice, obviously, we don't need to relive that saga. So as a result of that, the new con- personal conduct policy says that all domestic violence incidents start with a baseline of a six-game suspension. Okay? That's the starting point. <laughs> Now, let's talk real quick about what the NFL, the the standard of proof the NFL has. The standard of proof is not a criminal standard of proof, okay? They don't have to have a criminal conviction. There are no evidentiary rules. There are no rules of civil procedure. Those of you out there who are lawyers know what I'm talking about. Um, the, the rule basically is, do they think they, does the NFL, forget the, forget, Evidence, evidence, or any rules. Forget procedure. The Xenophil think they did it. That's the standard, okay? Um, and so, out of this whole year-long investigation came a report written by the director of investigations that presented uh, sufficient evidence for the NFL to conclude that he did it. And as a result of that, Zeke was suspended. Now, the CBA says he can appeal it, Elliot. Elliot has appealed it. As we record this, the appeal is pending. The hearing has already taken place, and the appeal is pending. Um, the hearing officer and the appeals officer are both appointed by Roger Goodell, pursuant to authority granted to him by the collective bargaining agreement. So what has happened, and why we're talking about this today, is that the NFLPA Players Association has filed a lawsuit in the Eastern District of Texas Federal Court on behalf of Zika Elliott, to try and, one, get an injunction in place to stop the suspension pending the litigation, and two, uh, have the federal court overturn the uh, the uh, NFL's disciplinary suspension. Be- so th- that is what's pending, okay? <laughs> um, now, what's important to note here is that, number one, a, a lawsuit regarding an arbitration uh, an arbitration um, the, a lawsuit regarding an arbitration proceeding cannot adjudic- re-adjudicate the facts in federal court. This is about the procedure. This is about whether the hearing conducted by the NFL was fundamentally fair or not. That is the legal standard. So the and I'm going to turn it over to you guys here in a second. I'm sorry I'm rambling but um so the lawsuit filed by Elliot goes on and on and on about what's fundamentally fair and what's fundamentally unfair. So before I keep going, because I could talk for an hour about this, what are you guys' initial thoughts? Um, I think it's uh, you, it's interesting. You started the conversation when you said that this is not um, there's no, this is not. Uh, a criminal trial. This is not a civil trial. This is this isn't um, the evidentiary uh, burden and all of that is not what this is all about. But it just seems that way. It just seems like a lot of legal um, mumbo jumbo. And I think that this is where um, the fact that Roger Goodell is the judge, jury, and executioner actually hurts him in this situation. Um, in that, you know, a player can say that there could be some procedural uh, procedural flaws in the process. Um, I, I think that the NFL has a problem here because on the one hand, uh, you have the NFL is saying they're going to crack down on domestic violence. But um, on the flip side, there's been a lot of uh, leaking of information on both sides that where it has the credibility of the young lady has been in question. And I think that that might be uh, part of Ezekiel Elliott's um, uh, argument. And um, I just think it's messy. And I, I think that the NFL is in a no-win situation here. Chris, thoughts? 
Yeah, I mean, this one is just a confluence of bad, you know? I mean, the 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 crime itself, the character destruction going on on all sides, uh, you know, I think the union has no choice but to sort of step in at this point. Um, and then also, there's a, to me, there's also this indictment of of just athletics in general, but specifically the high school to college pipeline in terms of, you know, what we're actually doing to protect these athletes that, have, you know, at this level, you know, the exploitation to protection ratio is so off that and we that's why we keep getting into these kind of scenarios, these kinds of scenarios. Um, OK, first of all, let's get something straight. Um a lot. I want everybody to understand that the petition filed by Elliot, if you've read it, this is not a statement of facts. Okay, this is a this is a list of allegations brought by the Players Association that they now have to prove. Okay, so you know while they paint a really bad uh, picture of the process regarding the hearing and the appeal people need to understand and remember that this is a one-sided argument we haven't actually seen the nfl respond to this yet so just keep that in mind um and the other thing is this issue that rich brought up about the credibility of the woman really and truly isn't a factor and isn't an issue here um not because she didn't have issues because i think she absolutely had issues with regard to her credibility which is why a criminal trial was not a criminal charge was not brought against elliot but just as an aside, remember, the standard for the NFL is that they think he did it. And that's as simple as, in as plain English the way as I can put it. And they thought he did it. And um, so anyway, so the, 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 the issue here, the, well, the first problem with the issue is, number one, this lawsuit isn't what's called ripe. There's a term in legal jargon called ripeness, and that means that the suit is ready for court. In this case, the the... You know, when you're talking about suing over an arbitration hearing, which is an incredibly incredible long shot in the first place, because courts traditionally don't like to mess with arbitration proceedings, particularly one that's collectively bargained. So this is a long shot no matter what. But in this case, um, the appeal hasn't even been concluded yet. And so a court could very easily pour this entire lawsuit out if, if, the, if the appeal decision doesn't come out before Tuesday, meaning after the Labor Day holiday. <laughs> They could just pour this out and say, bring this again when the uh, a collective bargaining hearing, collective bargaining approved hearing process is done. So that's the first problem. But um, so what we need to look for in the next few days for this is, is there is there going to be a, a, a an injunction, a temporary restraining order to keep Zeke for, to keep Zeke playing? The answer, in my opinion, is probably yes. Um. Courts traditionally tend to side on the side of granting restraining orders. It's been my my experience in this. Um, you know, the the standard of proof in a for an injunction is has there been irreparable harm? And the pleadings that the Cow that the Players Association filed is that the irreparable harm is that Zeke Elliott's not being present. Um, you know, for the start of the season, it ruins the Cowboys' season. You know, he's such a great leader and he's such a great player, blah, blah, blah. Um, I Courts traditionally tend to side on the side, and something like this at least, tend to side on the side of granting the restraining order because in their view, you know, delaying a, de- delaying a suspension a few weeks d- doesn't really hurt anything, okay? So expect I expect the restraining order to get granted. Um, the NFL is probably going to file a pleading to get this entire thing kicked, dismissed, um, so look for that. They will probably try to file their own lawsuit in New York City. I would assume they're going to try to do that. Um, but the issue here, again, is process. It's not let's review the specific allegations made by Tiffany Thompson. The issue is, is the NFL's process credible or not? And just remember, for all you guys out there who are rooting for the player, um, the NFL has wide-ranging powers. You know, there's no evidentiary standards. There's no requirement that the accuser be present at the appeal hearing. There's no requirement that Roger Goodell have to testify. There's no requirement that the NFL has to do anything, anything at all, other than be fundamental. What's called fundamentally fair. So this is not. A, this this is going to drag on and on and on for 
for quite a while. <laughs> the last thing I'd like to point out to you guys and get you guys' opinion on here, I, I think the NFLP is starting to overstep its bounds with these, and I think it's born out of the fact that D. Smith, who is the director of the NFLPA, is a employment law litigator. You know, the, the more of these that they challenge in court, you know, and force the NFL to spend legal fees and drag itself through the mud, the harder it's going to make the CBA negotiations. I think at some point in these, they need to stop fighting and let the NFL do its thing. Otherwise, I think the owners are going to crush them when it comes to the next CBA. So that's I, that's where I'd like you guys to... I could drone on and on about the legal part of this, but that's where I'd like to get you guys' input. I think their calculus... You may be right, and I, but I bet you their calculus is more the opposite. Whether it's right or not, we'll see. But is that if they don't start asserting some kind of punch and power, they're going to be completely toothless uh, in the next CBA. So I almost, my kind of, you know, layman's read of this is that they actually are picking a fight ahead of the CBA to see if they can't uh, engender better will in their rank and file, etc. I think it could backfire, and I'm not sure this is the track to lay on, but I think that whether yay or nay, this is positioning for the CBA either way. Um, I mean, it's certainly positioning for the CBA. It, you know, I just wonder if all of these, you know, if they continually challenge every punishment in court, I, I don't know if it's so much, you know, you know, ginning up support in the rank and file as ticking off the owners, you know. You know, if they continually drag the owners into court, you know, they're never going to give on this discipline stuff. You know, well, I think that that's what the process. I mean, if that's the process, and that's what the process allows. And um, I mean, I, I, if I'm a player, then I'm going to. I see what Tom Brady did, and I'm seeing what Ezekiel Elliott did. And to, for players, they just want to play, so they're just figuring out how can they make it make it from Sunday to Sunday. But see, this really isn't what the process allows. Is the thing, you know? There's when, when you put an arbitration process into a contract, and you especially a collective bargaining agreement, the intent of of st- of agreeing to arbitration is to spe- the specific and only intent is to keep it out of court. Okay, mm-hmm. that is the point of arbitration, and so the only way you can pick apart arbitration, no court ever wants to is going to ever overturn an arbitrator's decision on facts. Okay, that's never going to happen. That's not what courts do. Um, all you can do is challenge a process, but it's really not. In design to bring all these laws, all these cases to court, you know the the point is to not do that. And so I just think that um, at a mere, bare minimum, it's continuing to fracture the relationship between the owners and the players in a way that you know maybe you know look Zeke Elliott has made a continual nuisance of himself since the day he got in the NFL, right? I mean, you know he pulled a woman's top down at a parade. Um, you know, he was in a marijuana shop in, was it Seattle? I forget what city he was in. He's done a series of dumb things. And so he's not exactly been a model citizen. And there is evidence that he did it out there. Because the NFL doesn't want to hurt the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas Cowboys are a ratings machine. They don't want to irritate the Dallas Cowboy fans. Um, you know, so it's not some vendetta against Dallas. You know, so I think the NFL has evidence behind what they do and incidentally i mean the nfl won the brady case at the end of it they lost it at the trial court but they won at the appellate court so now there's an appellate court decision upholding in the second circuit um upholding the process this is why it's filed in texas the zeke elliott case because they're trying to get the fifth circuit to over to to uh, rule in favor of the players then you have a competing competing decisions amongst the appellate courts. So I think they're hurting themselves more than helping. You know, I, I'm not sure Zeke Elliott is the guy they want to fall on their sword over, frankly. Mm. So. Uh, let's transition on this quick uh, question. Does he play week one? Yes. I say yes. I think yes, because I think they're going to get a TRO, preventing the suspension from being... Um, I think the appeal is going to be denied, but I think they're going to get a TRO that allows them to play. 
All right. So we will. This will be a story we will continue to track because we are far from re- resolution on this one. Um, for our third and final topic today, um, another kind of really fascinating, multifaceted topic, and that is youth sports and specifically the multi-million, maybe nearing billion dollar industry of youth sports and its ramifications on on sports in general and our culture and, and the lives of youth. Um, so let's kick us off here. We recently watched a report on CNBC where they had done some investigative reporting and kind of brought up a lot of these issues. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll tweet the link and maybe even put it in the show description so you all can ch- check it out as well. Uh, but really fascinating topic. Uh, I've got kind of a personal narrative on this one I can share in a second, but I'd love to get your all's take. Rich? So I had a chance to look at the uh, video, and, and what I found to be very interesting is, I mean, this isn't anything new, and it, it, it continues to grow. We've talked a lot about how the um, the the NFL has lost a lot of uh, youth participation, but kids are playing other sports other than um, other than football. I mean, you've got travel baseball, which is huge. Um, hockey, which is becoming more popular, but is even is is more expensive. Um, you've got a lot of women's and girls sports uh, that are starting to take off quite a bit. But one of the things that I thought was interesting that they talked about is the other non-financial sacrifices that you have to make with youth sports, particularly the gentleman talked about missing family events and um, not being able to um, do other things. I mean, I know from personal experience, I have very close friends um, that uh, I have very close friends that are um, in travel sports and I never see them at all. Um, so um, it, it's 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 big business. Um, I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, maybe some of the parents, again, live vicariously through their kids. I'm not trying to say that's all parents, but um, I just find it very interesting. Um, yeah, I love this. I, uh, love this story. Uh, and instantly the article said, you know, the, the, the youth select sports thing is a $15 billion is a $15 billion industry. I'm right in the middle of the whole travel ball thing. So this is, this is, um, you know, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, and yeah, I'm one of those people that you know on the weekends the kids never home and you know all that because he's always playing baseball. <laughs> I get all that. Um, the fascinating part about it is to me is is it helping? Um, you know, is it good for the kid to do all this? You know, because 30 years ago when we were kids there wasn't a such thing as travel baseball, and there wasn't a such thing as AAU basketball that you know, had kids traveling all over the country, you know, and baseball teams that travel all over the country. And, you know, cause we've been all over the state of Texas for this baseball stuff. Um, you know, and, and is, is it one, is it good for the kid? And two, is it good for the, for his future or her future? Cause volleyball girls, volleyball is every bit as bad as every other sport. It's probably worse. Um, you know, and, and I'm not a hockey fan particularly, but hockey is really bad in travel. The only one that doesn't have this issue is football. Fo- there's no select football, youth select football teams because there's the risk of injury. So, um, but frankly, for, for baseball and basketball, the kids are playing more select travel, select baseball and basketball than they are high school games. And in the case of baseball, at least, the select baseball teams are more important than the high school teams. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess my question to you guys, and you guys are both fathers. Um, as a big picture issue, is this what kids should be doing, and is it worth it to do all this to get a college scholarship out of it? Yeah, it's um, you know, it's a real keep up with the Joneses issue. That I think helps to drive this, and I would completely agree that you know when I when we were kids, all probably in the same era, you know, the only traveling sport was really soccer, which was really the pioneer in that whole movement. And then you could tell it was a definitely class distinction in, in terms of the athletes and the investment that went in it. And you could start to see then that youth soccer was the also rans to the traveling team. So I think as kids, we did see this coming, just not the blossoming in all these other sports. And what's really really struck me as I watched the CSCN. CNBC piece was that 
my brother, younger brother, so this is, you know, mid-90s, early 90s, was a good enough gymnast to be on traveling teams. Um, and and he it, he dedicated his whole life to it. We traveled on weekends, all of that good stuff. This is in the mid-90s. Um, and when he wanted to wrestle and compete for his high school rather than, like, this random traveling team, and my parents let him, uh, that was his last few two years of basically high school eligibility, and it definitely was the difference between him and getting a gymnastic scholarship that stuck and and then not end up getting one. So it's really fascinating. It does have real world consequences when you make these kind of decisions between, you know, competing for your school or competing for reasons other than the the motive at the end, which is often the college scholarship. Is it worth it? I don't know. You know, you look at the cost of savings on the college. It it just might be. In fa- you know, in fairness to, in fairness to parents and and kids, it could be a situation where, you know, um, if you have a kid that develops a love, let's say for basketball, and they actually feel pretty good about themselves, and they actually feel pretty good doing it, um, why not allow them to go as far as they would like to go? And if that means travel, then that means travel. Um, so in, in all fairness, I think that there are kids and parents that engage um, in travel sports. It's not always it's not always meant to be cutthroat. It's not always cutthroat. It's not necessarily always meant to be exploitative. I mean, my daughter, she's not a um, she's I mean, she's a dancer. I don't know if that's but we travel and um uh, and the other thing is all of her friends do it. So then you develop a social circle. So what do you do? You say, well, you know, we, we'll no longer travel. And then, you know, it, there's a social element of it, too. So, yeah, I, you know, there, there are pros and cons to it. I, I can speak more about the baseball than other sports. You know, in the case of baseball, there are eight-year-old travel teams. You know, you have to be a good player at that age. Um, but there are eight-year-old travel teams that are traveling. It's usually late summer you know, that are doing uh, national tournaments in other places, um, you know, that's, it's awful young, you know, and, you know, when, when my kids were right, they were playing Little League baseball, and which is a whole day, Little League is in formal structure and everything else. Um, the, the the video that we listed noted how Little League base, uh, how participation in Little League baseball has declined. I think they said 20%, I believe. And it's because all these kids are going to the select travel teams because they know that ultimately that's better for their college, their their future potential for college scholarships. Because frankly, in the case of baseball, you really don't even need high school baseball to get a college scholarship anymore. You can do it just from the elite travel teams. Interesting. Because you know, we've, oh, sorry. we've been oh. there. You know, I, I've seen these teams play. We've played on these elite teams. <laughs> And it's a whole different kind of mindset when you're talking about those organizations. They run it in a – these are full-time the, – the elite baseball teams are full-time employees, full-time coaches that run a full-time program, you know, that costs hundreds of dollars a month, you know, that are – it is a serious big-time thing. And I just wonder sometimes if you're starting a kid off at eight years old, you know – is it really worth it for the kid? And what does that do to the kid's mentality? I, you know, you brought up a good point, Rich. That, you know, maybe the social circle becomes the kids you're traveling with. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, my daughter, um, you know, was sitting around over the summer and uh, the Little League World Series was on. And I didn't realize that my daughter would find that fascinating from the standpoint of she asked me, we had a discussion about it, is why is – why are they playing on TV? Why are they on ESPN? What I don't see the big, the big deal. And what made it so interesting is that because the Little League World Series is so long and drawn out, every time you turn on the TV during the summer, they were playing. So she had a real, she had a really hard time understanding the significance of you know eleven, twelve, thirteen year old kids uh, playing baseball on TV that she the same TV that she sees professional sports on. Well, you know, it's in, you know, in, what's interesting is that what she's seeing on TV is Little League, which those aren't even the best players. <laughs> you know, a lot of these select baseball teams would crush the Little League World Series teams. It wouldn't even be a fair competition. 
you know. And, of course, that Little League World Series years ago, decades ago, only the championship game was on TV, and now they're playing the regional finals on TV, which is why it goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks. So yeah. ESPN is contributing to the monetization of youth sports by televising so much of it. You know, they're mm-hmm. televising games that aren't even, that aren't even in Williamsport, Port, Pennsylvania. They're televising regional finals all around the country. So it's ESPN. This is another frequent topic of this show. ESPN is contributing to the monetization of youth sports for sure. Absolutely. It's really, if we go to the kind of social emotional piece with kids and should they, shouldn't they, what are they giving up, what are they gaining, uh, what really is sad is that, as you say, Steve, you know, talking about traveling baseball teams at the age of eight, you know, parents and caregivers in general have to make a real decision at some point early in the kid's life of whether this is a serious hobby or interest for them and then invest thusly, which is just way too early in general for kids to know fully what they want to invest themselves in right. kind of by, you know, body, mind, and soul and time. And so that to me is the real, I, I'd love to see, you know, I, we can legislate ourselves into all kinds of quandaries, but I don't know there's some way to kind of make sure that you don't have to pick a kid's future even if it's at just an intense hobby through adolescence at age seven or eight, that seems, you know, they should be sampling, not deep diving. True. And, and I'll say about the video, the, the CNBC video, you know, the, the, the speaker, I can't remember the guy's name, the primary speaker mentioned that um, only 2% of those who play select sports, baseball, basketball, volleyball, hockey, go on to get college scholarships. But... <laughs> what he's saying is a little bit of a skewed statistic because I can at least speak to baseball and basketball. Um, The kids who play basketball and baseball on the higher level elite teams that travel more get scholarships at a much, much, much higher rate, much higher rate. It's, you know, for the, for the very top teams, it's almost a hundred percent of those kids get scholarships. So it's depends on what team you have them play and you know what what tournaments they're playing in it's not really a fair and accurate to say well two percent of the kids gets who plays travel ball get scholarships because the kids who are playing the most travel ball get the most scholarships you know what's interesting with that is um uh, in, in fairness to some of the parents and some of the kids we also have to remember that in some of these cases some of these cases a few of these cases some of these kids are truly physically gifted right and i think that that isn't that is something that is worth developing even if the percentages are small that they'll be able to make a professional living out of it but i I think it's the same thing it could be the same thing with um with parents of kids who are prodigies and musicians i mean we don't hear you know you don't hear a lot of well you know multi-billion dollar cello uh you know uh industry and things like that so i think you, you when you're when you're a parent you want a kid to pick a hobby and maybe as Chris, as you mentioned, maybe that hobby is just something they'll dabble in for a couple of years. But sometimes that kid catches a hold of that hobby and says, I really like this and I want to go as far as I can with this. I might not be able to get a college scholarship, but it's something I'm good at. I'm not good at science. I'm not good at math, but I can play lacrosse and I'm a good striker in in soccer or football, wherever you're from. So. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, well, I'd be willing to bet that the cello players for the London Philharmonic Orchestra have been playing <laughs> the cello since they were four years old, right? And have right. been traveling around because there's, for those of you who don't know, there are musical competitions that you have to go to that are all yes. over the place. And I bet you anything that those kids did those competitions when they were a kid, and they went to Juilliard or some other big time music program as a result, and that's why they are. And you don't just look. You don't just fall into excellence in anything right. you do, you know, um, you know, unless your name is a Kardashian, at least, right. <laughs> you know, it right. takes work. And I think that most of the people that excel at things like athletics and athletics and music in particular have been doing it since they were very, very young. The trick is, um, I think you make a good point, Rich. The trick really to me is to recognize the kids that have the gift and then develop that gift. But if your kid doesn't have the gift, 
you know, maybe you need to consider whether spending tons of money uh, sending your kid to play basketball in Arizona and Alabama and Atlanta and everything else is really worth it. And let me just make one more point yeah. on the social part of it. Um, and you're from Texas. I mean, you're, you're in Texas. And, you know, I've, I'm close enough to Pennsylvania where I've seen it. If you look at how big, and this is something maybe we could talk about on another show, if you look at how big Friday night football is and high school football is, um, and you're a kid in a, you know, in a pretty small town or maybe a medium sized town. What are you doing on Friday night other than football? Where are your friends and where are your family? So if you're not in that scene and you're not in that circle, what else are you going to do? So, again, I mean, it's 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 really interesting in that everybody's not going to be able to make a living out of it. But, um, you know, it, it's it's what's it's what you it's, it could be. It's what you do. Um, on in your spare time and with your family and with your friends. Good point. <laughs> I, not to nerd out too much on child development psychology, and Rich, I'm sure you probably know some of this too. They do call the years between about eight and eleven the prodigy years because um, that's when youth do pick an interest and show some capacity can generally get pretty far advanced. That's why we see, you know, that's the prodigies are different that are super advanced, but it's basically those years right before puberty where we're kind of at one of those personal bests through our lifespan because we don't have puberty to deal with and we've we've kind of built interests and we've gone and gotten deeply skilled that's why we see things like the child star crash and the prodigies that don't make it etc because once the hormones kick in everything scrambles and the you know the ones that have the grit can pull through with their talent talent doesn't get you there alone so it is fascinating that all of this lands right on that kind of child development years of the the prodigy years and you know we'll see but as we get the dollar scales that we're talking about you know it, we as we know on this show that that can trump uh human interests yeah and not only that but yeah is um at least in the case of base i can speak to baseball and basketball the major Athletic companies are, are sponsoring these teams, and they're spending a lot of money to sponsor tournaments. We talked about it on, you know, as the ball turns a while ago. One of those tournaments that LeVar Ball blew up at was sponsored by Adidas, and we're talking about high school kids. And in the case of baseball, you know, Mizuno is sponsoring a bunch of teams and tournaments and everything else. And and so the, the there's money to be made at that level, you know, and when there's money to be made, we all know corporate America is going to make it. No matter what, and it sends the ESPN. ESPN is televising high school football games. You know, it's not just Little League World Series. They're televising high school football games. They're televising the McDonald's All American basketball game. You know, high school kids. So a lot of this has to do with the monetization of these sports by corporate America, which some people out there would have a big problem with. And the other thing we can't really, you know, because. Hyperactive parents have been a problem in youth sports since there's been youth sports, right? That's not a new phenomenon. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons for that is that as sports culturally comes so – has is so important and personal connections to the outcomes of sports greatly enhance your engagement and enjoy it, enjoyment. So as youth sports has exploded, that gives the parents and caregivers a much more – visceral reaction and they invest much more because now the the stakes are high and so i think some of the judgment of parents becomes clouded too um with dollar signs yes but also the emotional connection between their kids and their sport and they help actually drive probably some of the frenzy rather than as a guardrail against it yeah you know and and those are the parents that are buying their kids you know you know private coaching lessons above and beyond you know their teams and it goes on and on and on i mean the cost of this if you go all the way is astronomical and it mentioned that in the video you can spend if you add up all the private lessons and all the travel costs and all the monthly fees for the teams for all these sports you can spend close to what it would take to put a kid through a couple years of college yeah and well and, yeah and and what i think is it's not to make it overly simplistic, but if I'm a parent and I see that my kid wants to do this and my kid wants to play baseball and wants to play basketball or wants to play tennis, then as a parent, um, I mean, what am I going to say? You know, well, 
yeah, I know you want to play, but you know, let's just not let's let's not make it too let, let's not go too far. No, I mean, you want your kid to go as far as they would like to go. Right. I think it gets unhealthy when the kid says, you know, you made a great point, uh, Chris, about you know child development. You know, you have a you have a thing. You know, parents. Some of my um, you know my daughter's parents. We talk about their thing at this age my daughter's 11 but then as we know kids get older and uh interests wane and so when the interests begin to wane that's where you have parents where it gets dangerous like no i'm going to push you when the kid doesn't want to play tennis anymore they want to get a job at the mall or you know do other stuff yeah and and um you know i would say that i've seen plenty of athletic prodigies at 10 years old that are prodigies because genetically they're just bigger than the other kids they've grown faster and so they're bigger faster stronger and that doesn't keep up when all the kids hit puberty and all of a sudden those same kids are just athletically just another kid you know and yet their parents remember (laughs) the 10 year old Mm -hmm. you know playing 10 year old sports and kind of keep pushing that kid even though that kid you know who we thought was great really is just another kid Mm -hmm. and here's another angle here's another angle to it and this goes to the money part of it if, what are the sports that you can actually get better at without spending money? Like, for example, you know, you're not going to find a pickup baseball game where you can just go to the sand lot or to the field and you have the opportunity to play baseball every single day. Whereas basketball, and even this is waning when you don't have pickup basketball, as much pickup playground ball as you used to, um, when you can actually find competition to hone your, to hone your craft. So that's another aspect of it as well. Yeah, good point. Yeah. All right. What do you think, Chris? Have we beat this topic to death? I think for this one, um, <laughs> you know, the, this is a, you know, maybe when the Little League World Series rolls around again and some other uh, sort of topical stories spike, this is something definitely to revisit. It's also something we'd love to hear from you all out there in listener land if you have opinions about youth sports as a parent as a educator as a concerned citizen would love to hear um some reactions to this topic it's definitely one that i think most of us whether it's our own experience our experience of our kids etc have real personal connections to which makes it so interesting uh so and so complicated at the same time so give us a shout on twitter at the hog sty uh if you've got some thoughts on that um, that's a good transition into how can they reach you all. Uh, Steve, I'll get you the first crack at this because there is the fewest ways. So you want to tell people how to reach out? Uh, you can find me at Twitter at, at the Hogsty and on email at, at the Hogsty. Please do not try to track me down other than that because I have not made any of that public. All and right, can, and Rich. Yeah, you can find me at Disco Q, D I S C O Q U E 5 on Twitter. Someday you're going to have to tell us how a guy named Rich comes up with a handle named Disco. Um, there's probably a story. Uh, I'll tell you it's after the show. All right. <laughs> All right. And you can find me at Chris Larry 33 on Twitter, and that's the best and most efficient way. And we are out on this. We will see you in two weeks as we, at that point, will be into the throws of the early NFL season, which I'm sure, if I know the NFL industrial complex well, will <laughs> kick off a couple stories for us to chat about. All right, guys. Have a great one. Bye. All right. All Bye. right. <laughs>